Thank you. So we're in a, the third week of a series called God of the Underdogs. God of the Underdogs. And in your, in your chair when you came in today, there was a label that looked either something like this, or I think there's some solid white ones floating around. And um, if, you, if you wrote your name on here and stuck it on your, on your shirt, that's not what you were supposed to do. But it's okay. It's okay. Now, now maybe somebody around you knows who you are, where they you know, didn't before. Uh, we're, we're not necessarily a label-wearing church now, although it wouldn't hurt. I'm not saying it's a bad thing, but uh, we're going to talk about labels today, and we're going to talk about um, how we all have labels in our life, ways we identify ourselves, and I want to kind of start today by uh, giving you the main point giving you the, uh, the crux of what we're preaching about today. So if you don't hear anything else I say, you'll at least know the main purpose of the sermon this morning was this. The labels that we accept determine the life that we live. The labels that we accept and wear about ourselves determine the life we live. Not just labels that people throw at us, but the labels that we believe and embrace and accept about ourselves, whether they're good or bad. They determine how we, li- how we live. They determine uh, how we act in conversations and, and what we do in our life throughout the day. So we're going to talk about the label breaker this morning. The label breaker. A label breaker. A few labels that I have embraced and accepted in my life personally. Um, one is that I am a dad. I've accepted and embraced the label father, dad. And, and those of you that have children, you kind of understand how accepting and embracing that label changes your life a little bit. It changes how you act. It changes what you do. It changes, for me, it changed my hobby. Uh, I once played golf. I did. I once played golf a lot, and I was a, a decent golfer. I mean, I, uh, I, I carried a, a pretty good handicap for, a, you know, for, a, for an amateur. I, I had nice golf clubs. I had state-of-the-art golf clubs. I had all the right equipment. I had the nice golf balls, you know, not the little hacker golf balls, but nice golf balls. I was, I was more than a weekend warrior. I, I played the game. I knew how to play the game. I knew how to handle myself on the course and on nice courses. I, I, I was privileged to be able to play a lot of nice courses. And I, I got to where I was decent at the game, and I loved the game. I thought about it a lot. I, I would read the golf magazines. I would watch the golf channel. I would take golf lessons, well, I did at least early on. But I, I loved the golf game. And then I had two boys, and, um, and when one of them started playing sports, you know, it kind of cramped my golf style a little bit, but I was still able to make it work. And, but when my second one got old enough where he started playing athletics as well, Basically, I tried to hang on to my hobby for a while longer and then realized it was futile. I was not going to be able to keep playing this game. I was just going to have to set it aside and pick it up again at a later date. Accepting the label dad completely changed the way I lived my life. I didn't have the same hobbies anymore. Now my hobby is youth sports. That's what I spend my time doing, and I love it, okay? It's not that I don't love it. I I do love it, but it changed. That label changed the way that I live my life. Now I spend countless, untold hours at the baseball fields, at football fields, on basketball courts, hours and hours and hours, and now my my golf clubs, they're, they're outdated, I'm embarrassed by them. I got invited to play in a golf tournament earlier this year, and I, I had to pull them out of the, the, the corner of the garage. There were spiders crawling all over the place. And literally, I'm not joking, there were literally spiders all over the place. And, and, and uh, every time I would stick you know, my hand in the bag for a tee or, or a ball, I would you know, be afraid something was going to bite me. And I, I'm at the golf course, and I'm embarrassed about my clubs. I'm kind of hiding my clubs. I don't want anybody to see. You know, my clubs are 10 years old or whatever. Um, but but I'm, I'm not, not cutting edge anymore. Everything has changed when I accepted the label dad. When I accepted it and embraced the label pastor, pastor, there's a, uh, there's a significant one that, that has accepted 
I mean, that has determined in a lot of ways how I live. Pastor is one of those labels that have uh, that creates some awkward moments, that creates some awkward conversations. Whenever you're dealing with people, you know, who don't necessarily have a spiritual reference point, they don't have a spiritual bone, it would almost appear in their body. Um, when I would play golf with people, I used to always try to hold off as long as possible before they knew that I was a, a, a pastor, because um, you get to know people, you know, on the golf course, and uh, you know, there's people that they can't really say anything without an uh, expletive, uh, some well, some sort of four-letter word in the sentence. You know what I'm saying? And uh, eventually, after after you know, ten, twelve holes, they say, "So what do you do?" <clears throat> Well, I'm a pastor. And it's, 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 unbelievable. it's always been amazing to me the spiritual transformation that takes place right then and there. It's a miraculous thing. I mean, it's as if God changes them in that instant. And suddenly, they become spiritual too. Their language completely changes. And although they can't really put a sentence together because they're unaccustomed to talking without cuss words, they say things like, oh... Man, you know, they shake a ball and they say, sugar. It's amazing, the transformation. Or, or, or in the gym, this has happened to me in the gym, um, someone asked one day, you know, so what do you do? And it was the same, same kind of situation. And, and you tell them who they are and you are, and they go, oh, 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 oh. And they, they have no spiritual reference point. So they're, all, they're trying, they're digging within themselves to think of something to say about God, church. And they say things like, um, uh, my grandmother um, used to live next door to a church. <laughs> yeah. I, I have a grandmother too, yeah. Good, good, good. Or this is one that I get, I still get. Oh, you don't look like a pastor. Good, I think. I don't, I don't really know what that means. Is it because I don't, I mean, what is it? Is it because I don't have on pleated pants and cardigans? Is it because I don't need a sports jacket? Is it because uh, I don't have a collar, you know, a banded collar, or there's no robe? I'm not a priest, I'm a pastor. And, and this happened recently in the parking lot, on the side of the parking lot. Someone was in the parking lot who drove up in the building in the middle of the weekend, and they said, are you one of, uh, yeah, I'm one of the pastors. They said, are you, are, are you the youth pastor? <laughs> I like that one. I said, actually, no, the youth pastor is much older than me. <clears throat> so, But I've embraced the label. I've embraced that label as pastor, and it's changed. It does. It changes kind of how, how you live, conversations that I have. Um, and and accepting, accepting all of us, when we accept labels about ourselves, it determines how, how we live. And we all have labels, whether it's a mom or a spouse or a hard worker, maybe you've embraced that label. Or maybe someone called you good looking at some point, and you've embraced that label, and it affects how you live. It affects how you think, how, how you act in conversations. Maybe someone calls you funny and you think you know you're the funny one and and so now they have expectations for you to be funny all the time and you have expectations on yourself I'm the funny one I have to make everybody laugh so you're always in conversations and you're thinking of how am I going to make people laugh what am I going to turn into a a joke we all have labels talented athletic smart whatever it might be maybe you're a smart one and you're always looking for ways to reveal your great intellect in conversations Share with everyone how much you know about strange things that nobody else cares about, but you, for whatever reason, have all this knowledge about it, and you want to share that. Maybe you've accepted or embraced the moniker, the label that you are the smart one. Now, these are, these are positive labels that I mentioned, but we, we have negative labels as well, bad things that we have believed about ourselves that affect and determine uh, the way that we're living our life. Maybe you've embraced the label ugly, ugly. Maybe someone told you that at some point, or maybe it's something that you just believed about yourself, and no matter how many guys ask you out or how many girls flirt with you or how many Facebook comments you have on your profile pic about how handsome you are or how beautiful you are, you still can't get past the label that you're wearing that you believe about yourself that says ugly. Maybe you feel like you're unwanted dumb. Maybe you feel like you're fake. Someone told you you were fake and you've gone away thinking, am I fake? 
And after a while, you start to believe it about yourself. Selfish. Maybe you believe yourself to be a failure. Um, maybe you believe yourself to just be a loser or, or lazy. What label is it that you're wearing about yourself? If we were to pull these labels out, everybody get that label out and hold it. And we were to take a moment and just write a word on the label, what would that word be for you? What would the negative word be for you? What have you believed about yourself that is negatively affecting how you're living your day-to-day -day life, how you're interacting with people, maybe how you're treating your spouse, or maybe how you're treating your children? It's a negative label that you've just embraced. In many ways, you think, this is just who I am. I don't think I can ever really change this. Maybe a spouse told you this, or an ex-wife or an ex-husband told you this. And you've just decided this is how that I guess I'm going to have to live the rest of my life. Maybe it's something a teacher said, a coach said. Maybe it's something that uh, your, your dad said when you were just a little boy or just a little girl. And ever since that moment, you've accepted this label about yourself. And it's negatively affecting how you're living your life. Here's what I want to do. I want to take just a moment. And I want you to get a pen. And I want you to write that label, whatever it is, on that card. You have permission for it to be completely private. This is not something you're going to share. You don't have to share it with your spouse. You don't have to share this with anybody around you. But the one word about yourself that's negative, that you have embraced, and you think, I guess this is just the way it's going to be, whatever it might be, I want you to write it on that label. And then just hang on to it. Just keep that to yourself and hang on to it. There's a story of an underdog in the Bible named Jacob. And you'll see very quickly why he came into this world as an underdog. Jacob was a twin. He had a twin brother. And his mom, Rebecca, when she was pregnant with these twins, God told her that she was pregnant with twins because they didn't really have equipment to help people know they were pregnant with twins then. And um, in Genesis chapter 25, this story is in the first book of the Bible, the book of Genesis, and we'll pick it up in Genesis chapter 25. Genesis 25 and verse number 24, Rebecca is about to have twins. When the time came for her to give birth, there were twin boys in her womb. The first to come out was red, whatever, and his whole body was like a hairy garment. So they named him Esau. Now, Esau literally means hairy. They saw the baby had hair all over him, and so they named him Harry. They weren't very creative with names in those days, so just whatever the baby looked like when it came out, they would call it what it was, as you're about to see about Jacob. But I... I I think there were probably a lot of babies named Slimy in those days as well. Not a lot of creativity. Anyway, moving on, Genesis 25 and 26. After Esau, his brother came out with his hand, his little tiny infant hand, grasping Esau's heel. So he was named Jacob. He was named Jacob. There, there, was, there was a Hebrew saying in that time that, uh, that talked about someone grabbing and reaching after someone else's heel. And it meant if a person did that, it meant that they were likely to be a trickster or a deceiver. And so since Jacob was, as a baby, came out of the womb, reaching and grabbing his brother Esau's heel, they named him Jacob, which literally means deceiver. Deceiver. So from the time Jacob was born, he had been labeled deceiver. From a little kid onward, he was called, to, everybody referred to him as deceiver. That was his name. That's what he grew up hearing from the time he was a baby. So it's no wonder that as Jacob got older, guess what he became? You guessed it. He became a deceiver. This label had been put on him when he was just a baby. All because when he was an infant being born. 
You see how crazy this is? When he was an infant being born, his little infant hand happened to be reaching toward his twin brother's heel as they were born. And because of that, he was labeled deceiver. And he became a deceiver. He deceived his brother. He deceived his father in his life. He deceived his father-in-law. He embraced and accepted this label. It's unbelievable that they gave him that name just because of the way he was born. A lot of people have been given labels in their life for no legitimate reason. Some people, yeah, maybe have received labels because of things that have happened in their life and you might think you deserve this label. But others, others, uh, you, you've, you've got a label on you that you don't think you deserve, but yet for whatever reason, it's been with you for so long, you've just embraced it and accepted it. And so, Jacob ultimately lived up to that label. What is yours? What is it about yourself? I had many labels in my life attached to me. I remember whenever I first uh, felt a call to ministry, um, the, the preaching side and pastoring side of ministry, I had people that didn't dare at all think that I would be able to do that you know why? Because, because I was a singer. How can you sing and preach? You can't be a preacher. You're a singer. Don't stop singing to start preaching. And for years, whenever I did get into ministry and became a pastor at the church that we were at, well, three, a couple different churches, um, people would say, oh, you're a, you're, a, you're, a, you're a pastor too? I just thought you were a singer. Just a label that people had put on me, put on me and it bothered me for a little while. Then I ultimately embraced it and I think it's okay for me to do both. I think it's okay. Uh, but, but all sorts of labels. What is it for you that you've embraced about yourself that's been put on, that's been put on you? Loser, selfish, introvert, stupid, sad, addict. What is it that you've embraced and said, okay, this is just who I am. There's just nothing I can do about this. I was told this by my dad. I was told this by my coach. I was told this by my peers, my spouse, my my, my ex-wife or ex-husband, and so I guess I'll just be like this from now on. It's such a reality now that it's just the way it is. Jacob found himself where many of us find ourselves, believing a lie about ourselves. He was, he was desperate, he was alone, he was hurting, and he had no idea how to fix the problem in his life and the label that had just become who he was. He wanted to change his label but he could not own his own. He tried to change his label, label by deceiving his brother. That just made things worse for him. He tried to change his label by deceiving his father. That just made things worse for him. He could not shake that label of deceiver. In fact, he made things worse for himself. Later on in Jacob's life... Um, we find him running for his life from his twin brother Esau, the hairy guy, because he had deceived Esau. And when he deceived Esau, Esau got quite angry about it. And once he realized what had happened, it took him a while to realize really what had happened. When he realized what had happened, he set out to destroy Jacob, set out to kill his brother. And so he began to, Esau and his men began to chase after Jacob and Jacob's family. And Jacob is literally running for his life. And we're going to pick up the story in Genesis chapter 32. But before we read that, this, the story is amazing and crazy because throughout Jewish history, you always hear the names Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They're just part, they're fathers, if you will, of the Jewish faith. The men who the bloodline of the Messiah would be carried through in order to bless our world. But up until now, up until now in Jacob's life, it hadn't happened. The, 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 his name wasn't in the mix as of yet. We know, in retrospect, that God intended to do amazing things through Jacob. But at that time, he didn't know it. He just knew that his name was Deceiver. He had become a deceiver. He was wearing that label, not with pride. He hated that label, but he was wearing it. And now, because of his deception, he was having to run for his life. 
But God intended to do something amazing with Jacob's life. But before he could do that, Jacob was going to have to come to grips with this label and allow God to bring about a change in him. Not trying to fix it himself, but allow God to bring about a supernatural change in his life. So the story that we're about to read, Jacob is running from his brother Esau. And literally it's nighttime, and Esau is going to be upon him the very next day. And he knows either God does something tonight, or I'm going to die tomorrow because of my label, deceiver. I'm not going to make it through tomorrow if God doesn't do something tonight. So here, let's pick up the story. Genesis chapter 32 and verse 22. That night, Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two maidservants, and his eleven sons, and he crossed the ford of the Jabbok. After he had sent them across the stream, he sent over all of his possessions. So Jacob was left alone. Jacob was left alone, the very next verse. He, he sent everybody across, sent all of his stuff across, all of his family members across, and he's left alone to talk with God, as we're about to see, to wrestle with God. Because he's reached the end of his rope. He knows he can't go any longer wearing this label. And yet there's nothing he can do about it. He must have God's help. He's all alone. Some of you might feel like that today. You might feel like you're at the end of your rope. Nobody can help you. Wife can't help you. Friends can't help you. Kids can't help you. Money can't help you. Nothing's helping you. You need supernatural intervention. uh, Jacob is all alone. Verse 24. And a man wrestled with him till daybreak. A man wrestled with him until daybreak. Then the man said, and and I, I... there's all kind of theology here and all sorts of different, different theologies actually about who Jacob was actually wrestling with. But everybody comes to the conclusion, all theologians, whether it was a literal manifestation of God or it was an angel of some sort that Jacob was wrestling with, that Jacob was literally wrestling with God, essentially. He was wrestling with God. You can go and have fun studying that. Study that out for yourself and just bring me back all the things that you find. Actually, don't. But, but if you find something great, you can. But, but essentially, he's wrestling with, with God. So Jacob is wrestling with a man until daybreak because, man, he's at the end of his rope. God, I've got to have help. Then the man said, let me go for it's daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. I'm at the end of my rope. I'm going to die tomorrow because of this label deceiver. I cannot deal with this anymore. I've got to have help. You must bless me. Now listen, one of the greatest ways for God to bless us is to change our label. We we always have it in our mind, and I'm sure Jacob did as well, what he wanted from God. It was probably like, God, will you like kill Esau or like put a you know put an invisible wall up between me and Esau? Because he's gonna kill me if you don't. God, you got to help me and my family. I'm sure Jacob had it in his mind what he wanted to see happen, just like you do, just like I do. But one of the greatest ways for God to bless us is not to give us more money, not to fix our problem all the time for us. But one of the greatest ways for God to bless us is to change our label, change our label. The man asked Jacob, whenever he said, you got to bless me, the man asked him, what is your name? What is your name? I want you to get honest about the issue that you're carrying. Get honest with me about who you really are, what you've embraced and accepted as just part of your life, and if you'll get honest about that, then, then we're headed somewhere. Then we can do something. But first of all, what, this is a huge question. It's huge. What's your name? Are you willing to give this to him today? Jacob, are you willing to give that label that you're carrying, that affecting the way you're living your life in a negative way, are you willing to give that to, to God? Are you willing to say, I'll tell you what I am today, Jesus, I'm lonely. I tell you what I am today, God, I'm, I'm broken, I'm bitter. 
I've got bitterness in my heart. And it's affecting the way I'm treating those around me and the way that I'm living my life. I've got bitterness for something that happened to me when I was a child or something that happened in my first marriage. I'm carrying anger and bitterness and it's affecting my life. That's my label. Are you willing to be honest with God about who you really are? The man said, what is your name? And he answered, Jacob. Jacob, I'm a deceiver. And instantly the man said, okay, now we're getting somewhere. Your name will no longer be deceiver. No, no. Now we're going to call you Israel. Because you have struggled with God and with men and you have overcome. Jacob means deceiver. You know what Israel means? Israel means one who reigns with God. Or man of God. That night, when Jacob had reached the end of his rope, there was nowhere else to go, nowhere else to turn. He said, God, you have got to help me. I've got to rid myself of this label. And God said, all right, you've come to the right place. You've come to the right person. I'm about to supernaturally change everything about you, and you're going to go from being a deceiver to being one who reigns with God. And from that moment on, Jacob's life completely changed, and he began to fulfill God's destiny for his life. Esau did not kill him the next day. As a matter of fact, they reunited and it was a, a peaceful, peaceful time together. And ultimately, God used the bloodline of Jacob for the Messiah to come through. He's part of the lineage of Jesus. But here's the truth about that. For most of us, the label that we're wearing, we can't fix it ourselves. We need God to change our label. One of my favorite scriptures in the Bible, and if, if North Rock had a theme verse, this one would be it, 2 Corinthians 5.17, New Testament, Paul writing to the church in Corinth, and he said these words, this means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. Everybody say new person. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. That's what Jesus can do for you. That's what my Savior can do for you. So what if it were possible to rid yourself of this label? That in many ways you've come to believe there's nothing you can do about it and it'll always be this way. But what if it were possible for God to bring about a supernatural change and miraculously do a work in your life and in your heart? He's a label breaker. I love that about him. And just like he changed Jacob from a deceiver to one who reigns with God, he can heal you and change your life, your situation. All things become new. Would you close your eyes? I want to pray for you. I want to pray for you this morning. Lord, there's people all over this room that are carrying all sorts of labels. Wrestling God with things that have been said over them or said about them from the time they were children in many cases. Something that they dealt with in a marriage, something that they dealt with in another relationship. Maybe a friendship. They're carrying a label that they, that they hate about themselves and yet They've embraced it and believed it. God, today, this amazing day, we're going to lay these labels at your feet and we're going to ask you to work a supernatural miracle in lives all over this room. And people that have walked into this room today feeling lonely, people that have walked into this room today feeling angry, we're going to ask you to begin a work right now to change those labels. From lonely to fulfilled. From angry to happy. From pain to peace. From sadness to joy. Whatever it is, 
from addict to free, whatever it is in this room, we're asking you right now, in Jesus' name, work and touch and change names, change labels. We accept it. We embrace it. We receive it in the name of Jesus. You know, those in this room who maybe you've never given your life to Jesus, maybe you've never made Him the Lord and the Savior of your life, I'm going to pray for you. You've never given your life to Him. You've never said yes to Him. Just like I read in the book of Corinthians, your old life can be gone and all things can become new in an instant. If you've never given your life to Jesus, you've never said yes to Him, you've never made Him the Lord and the Savior of your life, I want to give you a chance to do that with nobody looking around but myself and the pastors. If you want to say yes to Jesus today and invite Him into your heart, into your life, would you just hold up your hand with nobody looking around but myself and the pastors? I see that. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I see those. Anybody else want to join these? Hold your hand up high. Yeah. Yeah. Fabulous. Put your hands down. We'll get you to just pray this prayer along with me. Lord Jesus, thank you for loving me enough to give your life for me. Thank you for loving me even though I feel unlovable oftentimes. I pray in this place, Jesus, that you would do a work, that you would heal, that you would deliver. Forgive us for our sins. Forgive me for my sins, my mistakes. Forgive me for trying to fix things of myself and often making things worse. I give myself completely to you today, this morning. In Jesus' name, I'm starting over and I'm following you. I want you to be the Lord and the Savior of my life. In Jesus' name.